It's time for the Bill Ferguson Show. This is Phil Ferguson, and you are listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. The grand adventure in the state of Florida continues. I think I've resolved to the best of my ability, at least for this season, how the pool is going to work. Uh, for those of you who haven't been keeping score, uh, the pool has a really hard time staying warm when the temperatures drop below 40. I know, I know, big surprise, big surprise. But I've used a pool cover. And then a second pool cover. And of course, I do have, it came with the house, a nice water heating solar panel system. It's always tricky. I don't know what exactly to call it because it's not photovoltaic portals, polar set. Oh my God. Solar panels. <laughs> They're water solar panels. So the pump pushes the water way up on the roof and it sloshes around through a whole bunch of black tubes and it comes down considerably warmer into the pool. And of course, in the winter, when the air is cold and the ground is cold and the sun is low, these solar powered water heating panels don't do enough. Uh, I found with the uh, two covers, it would allow the pool to heat up a little bit, but then when it got to be night, it would cool down a little bit and we could probably get close to 80 yeah, on every day except for the extremest cold. And so I did buy a supplementary heat pump, which is a thing of magic. I, I still do not fully understand how it works, um, but they're really cool because normally, uh, like an electric heater, if you want to heat water, they're measured uh, often in how efficient they are. So based on the amount of electricity that it uses, how much of that electricity is converted into heating the water. It could be 70, 80, 90%. It's kind of like furnaces and air conditioners. How efficient are they? And the closer you get to 100%, the better. Well, I'm going to explain this really poorly, so forgive me, but maybe I'll have a heat pump expert. If you know one or you are one, let me know. But the heat pump, instead of being 85, 90, 92% efficient, it can be four or 500% efficient. I know, right? How the fuck is that possible? You ask yourself, and that's a great freaking question. And basically the heat pump itself does not actually heat the water. I mean, it does, but the main job of a, of a heat pump is to separate hot from cold. And now that's where you're going to have to go watch some YouTube videos or read some blogs about it, which I've done. I'm still not a hundred percent sure I understand it, but on one side of the equation, you get really cold something, in this case, air. And so the waste product, the byproduct of this heat pump that's heating the water for our pool is it blows out really, really chilly, cold air. And of course, on the other side, it creates a liquid, uh, a fluid that is quite warm and the water circulates in and around and amongst that kind of like you might normally expect fluid to move and the fluid gets warm. So the heat pump doesn't heat the water per se, it separates hot from cold. Anyway, the, the end result is for a dollar to a dollar fifty a day, I can add to my pool one to 1.5 degrees of temperature, which I know that's not a lot, but if I run it eight to 10 hours every day, assuming it's warm enough, then with the two pool covers, it can retain some of that heat. And I think even at the coldest parts of winter in Orlando, Florida, where hopefully it never gets to freezing, but you have a few days where it's below 40 and maybe during the afternoon it's 55 or 60, there might be a few days, a handful of days, maybe seven to 10 to 14 days where the pool, even if the pool is warm enough, you may not want to go in it because 
when you hop out and the air is 55 and there's a, a brisk wind, that's going to really get your attention. Now, maybe I'll be nuts and I'll swim down to 80 degrees because if I hop in and do laps and do physical exertion, it's still not too bad until I get out and then I'll just dry off and get inside real quick. So it'll be okay. Um, but uh, right now we're in middle, late February and the pool temperature is hovering around 86 to 90 degrees every day with the combination of all these things. And so uh, as the air temperature continues to rise, as the sun gets higher in the sky and as the water solar panels on the roof get better and more efficient at, with more sun, longer period of sunlight exposure and the sun being higher in the sky combined. Now the question is, what what do I undo first? And probably, of course, would be the uh, heat pump because it's using electricity. So no need to do that. And then probably I'll remove the second cover. And probably by the summer, I'll have no cover on for most days because now the challenge is the pool gets too hot. And I learned from uh, last year, at least during the wet season, which might be June and July and August, September, when it rains every day, the pool, you have a risk of it overflowing because it rains faster than it evaporates, which, you know, just fun, different problems. So we've got that going on. And of course, now we're in the mid eighties for highs for the next week, again, in mid, late February. So the heat's a coming, uh, it's going to come and go, but it looks like it's here for a while. So we're having fun with that. Uh, other adventures, uh, we have finally fixed our oven. And it works as expected. And I could give you the entire long drama of that. I could not even believe it. But the short of it is we had a company come in and appraise the oven. And the first thing they told me to do was tell my wife to read the manual. Well, that, that didn't go over very well. And uh, we had them come back. And the second time they did the same thing. And basically, and it's a, a Frigidaire oven they had to follow the Frigidaire protocol for testing the oven. So they turned the temperature to 350, the oven went to 350, and then a few minutes later, 10 minutes later, it's 320. And according to Frigidaire, that's within the acceptable tolerances of their oven. I don't find that to be within the acceptable tolerances for an oven, but what do I know? I asked the... Uh, experts that were in the house, the, the repair crew, uh, let's try 425 because I've had tried to cook a pizza and it would go to 425 and then the temperature would fall a lot. And so I got clever and I said, well, I'll put it at 450 and make it rerun up to a new higher temperature. And after a long period of not cooking the pizza, it then burnt the pizza. So that doesn't make it workable. So they said, okay, we'll put it to 425 and they put it to 425 and the oven went to 425. But then 10 or 15 minutes later, the oven is down 350 or below, which obviously is not holding its temperature. But their position was that that's not within the standard protocol that's approved by frigid air. And so the test is meaningless because the test they have to do worked. Well, it, it worked within the tolerance that they were acceptable with. So the end result is there was nothing wrong with the oven, even though it basically was not usable. We even asked if they could just order the parts that we thought were wrong, that we, my wife did a lot of research online and found out that this is a known problem with this model. And here's the parts you need to replace. And they said, well, if they replace the parts, they could do that, but they can't guarantee the work. And it's probably going to have the same problems from our perspective, because that's just how this model of oven works. We started looking at uh, replacement ovens and I, I don't know if this is inflation I don't know if this is me being older than fuck uh, or if people just don't use wall ovens anymore and this is what is in our house but you very quickly get up into the thousands of dollars to replace wall ovens and of course then you get into the whole thing of which features do you want to get and is this worth $500 more is that worth $500 more and since the only thing I basically do with an oven, how sad and pathetic I am, is I might warm up some chicken nuggets or pizza. And matter of fact, a lot of that now I do with an air fryer. Get a little, little personal size pizza, fits in the air fryer. 
Because the problem with a big pizza is I'll eat it. <laughs> so I only make a small pizza. And when I eat that, I'm full. And I don't eat a whole nother second small pizza, which would be equivalent to probably the big pizza. We called a second company. They came and took off part of the um, the framing or the, I don't know what to call it, the, the outer part of the metal where the control panel is. They opened it up, looked at the control panel and said, oh, uh, this control panel has heat damage and you need a new control panel. No, no testing at 350, no testing at 425 or 450. Uh, just you need a new control panel. They ordered it. Uh came you know a week or two later the guy came back to the house yesterday he put it in run it to 350 the temperature is within a few degrees 350 he puts it at 425 the temperature goes to 425 and stays to 425 everything's amazing and of course it's not a gas not a gas oven oh the big drama with gas ovens nowadays but anyway so that's some of the fun stuff that's going on here uh later in this show we're going to have real good fun we're going to talk about Binance and the cryptocurrency called BUSD, which is not made by Binance unless it is. <laughs> That's so fucking hysterical. I'm going to talk about qualified dividends, which a lot of people don't know that when you get dividends, you used to have to pay your higher income tax rate on stock dividends. But now the vast majority of U.S. stock dividends qualify for long-term capital gains tax rates, even though the dividends are not um, either long-term or capital gains. So it's just what the rules are. And you might ask, and I go over it in the segment, so I don't want to ruin it here for you, but you can guess really wealthy people make a lot of money on capital or on uh, stock dividends and they wanted to pay lower taxes. So Congress passed a law that said to uh, Capital or not capital gains, dividends from stock investments now pay the lower tax rate, 15, 20% for most people. Whereas if you work and earn your income, you might pay 18 or 20%, but you might pay 25, 30, 37, maybe even 40 when you add together your state income tax. So in many cases, wealthy people are making or paying a lower tax rate than people who are earning the money. How's that? Good to be rich in this country, right? And then another segment, three, three fantastic segments today on RMD, required minimum distribution, and a wonderful email from a listener that said, hey, Phil, I think you have mentioned in the past that maybe I should take the RMD, the required minimum distribution, early in the year. Why is that? What's your logic for that? And if I take out money sooner than I have to, Am I not missing the upside potential of making more money in the market? Because most calendar years, the market's up. So shouldn't I leave it in the longest amount of time possible? So in short, RMDs, take them out as quickly as you can in a new calendar year. But the segment goes through all the reasons why, in my opinion, I think that is the best thing to do. We're going to take a quick break and come back with all of that fun stuff. And they told me the story all about this guy named Lehi who lived in Jerusalem in 600 BC. Now, apparently, in Jerusalem in 600 BC, everyone was completely bad and evil, every single one of them, man, woman, child, infant, fetus. And God came to Lehi and said to him, put your family on a boat and I will lead you out of here. And God did lead them. He led them to America. I said, America? From Jerusalem to America by boat in 600 BC? And they said, yes. Then they told me how Lehi and his descendants reproduced and reproduced, and over the course of 600 years, there were two great races of them, the Nephites and the Lamanites. And the Nephites were totally, totally good, each and every one of them, and the Lamanites were totally bad and evil, every single one of them, just bad to the bone. Then... After Jesus died on the cross for our sins, on his way up to heaven, he stopped by America and visited the Nephites. And he told them that, that if they all remained totally, totally good, each and every one of them, they would win the war against the evil Lamanites. But apparently somebody blew it. 
because the Lamanites were able to kill all the Nephites. All but one guy, this guy named Mormon, who managed to survive by hiding in the woods. And he made sure this whole story was written down in reformed Egyptian hieroglyphics chiseled onto gold plates, which he then buried near Palmyra, New York. Well, I was just on the edge of my seat. I said, what happened to the Lamanites? And they said, well, they became our Native Americans here in the U.S. And I said, so you believe the Native Americans are descended from a people who were totally evil? And they said, yes. Then they told me how this guy named Joseph Smith found the, those buried gold plates right in his backyard. And he also found this magic stone back there that he put into his hat and then buried his face into. And this allowed him to translate the gold plates from the reformed Egyptian into English. Well, at this point, I just wanted to give these two boys some advice about their pitch. <laughs> I wanted to say, okay, don't start with this story. I mean, even the Scientologists know to start with a personality test before they start <laughs> telling people all about Xenu, the evil intergalactic overlord. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. This is a segment for the crypto shit show. <laughs> um, the Ponzi scheme continues and uh, bad news abounds for the people who are disconnected from reality and today's little fun comes from a company you've never heard of because I never heard of it called Paxos and Paxos makes a little coin called the Binance US dollar coin. And this is something I talked about just a few episodes ago. It's a thing called a, a stable coin. And theoretically, a stable coin is backed dollar for dollar, which, of course, to me is hysterical because as the percentage of stable coins in the in the crypto universe has increased it becomes more and more like dollar transactions so if you're going to do dollar transactions why not just do dollar transactions but the reason for this might be because people can play games and there are there were roughly uh 16 billion dollars worth of binance us dollar coins and the weird thing is they're created by a company called paxos who just got served uh, with a notice from the new york state financial services let's see new york department of financial financial services kind of a cease and desist order that where they're ordered to stop creating these coins because there might be pending investigation or an investigating with pending charges and I think maybe I'm getting ahead of myself. So <clears throat> let me back up a little bit. Uh, let's see, because I, I did a post on this on Facebook. Uh, number one, stablecoin, BUSD, tries to keep a dollar value. Great. Uh, stablecoin is a currency which attempts to maintain a stable price. We talked about that. A coin is supposed to be backed by something. Its value should be pegged to an underlying stable asset like gold, which I, lo I laugh, I scoff at the idea that gold is something that's stable, or in this case, US dollars. Now, you might think if I own 16 billion in $1 coins that I back them up with $16 billion worth of dollars. But no, what they have is options and trading things on uh, US treasuries, which recently, and when the Fed increased interest rates again, their value went down. So if you're leveraged in intermediate and long-term U.S. treasuries, you could have in the last couple of weeks lost 10 or 15% of the money. So these guys should come up with billions of dollars to fill the gap. But anyway, so Paxos mints or out of thin air creates BUSD, Binance, U.S. dollar stable coins. 
and, and they're using the name Binance because Binance is now the largest remaining crypto broker in the world that has not yet filed for bankruptcy or some kind of protection. The New York regulators ordered Paxos to stop minting the coins and Paxos came out and said, yeah, sure, we'll do that in 14 days. So I don't know if the New York regulators are going to be okay with that or whatever, but they're still minting coins. Uh, let's see, US, U, BUSD tokens are backed by $16 billion worth of treasuries and treasury reserve repurchase agreements, like I told you about. That could be a problem. Uh, Binance has now come out and said that BUSD, the Binance US dollars, are like totally safe, man. And they are distancing themselves, Binance, from the coins that have their name on it. And I quote from two tweets, BUSD is issued and redeemed by Paxos. That's cool. Still got your fucking name on it, Binance. And then that wasn't enough. So Binance came out and said again, BUSD is a stable coin wholly owned and managed by Paxos. Kind of like something Trump might say, never met the guy. Never heard of him, never took a picture with him, and he's not using my name, Binance, at all. We don't even know who they are, which is hysterical, given a couple of the points that I have coming up, but I'll get to that. Um, Paxos announced that they'll stop making these coins, and they will also end their relationship with Binance. Now, this is effective uh, February 21st, and the first article I was reading was from February 12th, so there's a big gap here. Uh, says here, Paxos will cease issuance of new BUSD tokens uh, as directed by and working in close coordination with the, U the New York Department of Financial Services. So that's interesting. And like I said, this is a potential investigation and I'm quoting from an article here. The potential SEC charges came through what is known as a Wells Notice which informs firms of the results of an investigation with pending charges. <laughs> so it's already been investigated and charges are forthcoming. So the shit is currently hitting the fan and Paxos is freaking out as they should be. The SEC Securities and Exchange Commission has declared that BUSD is a security. Uh, they have already done this with other issues, and that has not gone well. This has happened to other firms like Gemini, Genesis, and Kraken, and you may or may not recall, those have not gone well. Uh, most of those, I think two out of the three have filed bankruptcy or protection of some kind. Uh, number 10 in my list of stuff here. Uh, of course, there are those calling for regulation to, to protect investors and make crypto more reliable and more credible. Uh, the funny thing, of course, is it's never the people that are creating the scam. And I worry that uh, regulation, official recognition of cryptocurrencies would tell some people or indicate to some people this whole thing is legitimate. But it's not. It's a multi-layered Ponzi scheme where everyone is building houses of cards on other people's houses of cards. And it will all eventually go poof and collapse into nothingness. Um Point 11, as I said before, Binance has declared that they have nothing to do with the coin that has their name on it, except, and, and you're going to love this. Uh, I am saying that this is a clear example of the fuckery that goes on. And again, I quote from the article, Binance's self-issued BUSD uh, stable to token, which is different than Paxos created BUSD, which is um, not regulated by the New York Department of F Financial Security, is independently wrapped and issued by the crypto exchange, aka Binance, on blockchains outside of the Ethereum blockchain where the Paxos BUSD is tracked or followed or on the chain, on the blockchain. In other words, Binance can take a single Paxos-issued BUSD coin, create an analogous BUSD coin on another blockchain, and freeze the corresponding Paxos-issued BUSD. 
If that didn't make sense, it shouldn't. But basically what Binance is saying is that this is our coin. Whereas in the last day or two on Twitter, they're saying, we don't know these guys, but they have a history of taking their coin and minting an ana analogous coin and putting it on other blockchains. And the uh, New York Department of Financial Securities has said that they do not recognize the Binance pegged BUSD on any blockchain as a authorized or regulated security, which means you're on your own, folks. <laughs> you're on your own. Another fun bit of news I found Googling around was that about five months ago, Binance, again, the single largest crypto brokerage firm in the world, forcibly converted several other stable coins to BUSD. I'm assuming it's the BUSD that Binance created by putting a hold or not using the Paxos BUSD, assuming any of that is actually honored. And they took funds from clients' accounts, sold them for the dollar that they may or may not have been worth, and replaced them one for one with the now potentially scandalously value limited or un overvalued BUSD coins. Well, there's a lawsuit waiting to happen. You have $1,000 in another stable coin that you think is worth $1,000, and they forcibly switch out your one investment with another investment that you now find is worth something less, and you had no control over on it because there's no regulations, and this whole thing is the fucking Wild West at best. Uh, let's see, here's a quote from that article. Binance announced earlier this month that they will auto-convert, I call that forcible conversion, existing balances of new deposits of USD coin, uh, PAX dollar, true USD, uh, and all of those will be converted to uh, the Binance version of the Binance USD stable coin. Oh my God. Uh, let's see, what else we got? Oh, in about eight hours, $290 million worth of BUSD has been redeemed and or liquidated by people that hold it. Now, as of this point in time, while $290 million seems big, and it is because that's just eight hours, there were theoretically $16 billion worth of coins. And of course, at some point, Paxos is going to have to cough up part or all that $16 billion if this coin goes to zero. So if Paxos is in any way, or if Binance, when converting the Paxos BUSD into their own BUSD, I cannot even believe I'm reading this shit and saying it out loud. So inane. I can't hardly breathe through this. If all of that doesn't convert dollar for dollar, somebody's going to lose money. And right now, while the trading is still going and, and until it gets halted, the last one out is going to be the fucker holding the bag. And I was going to record this segment later, but what just happened, I'm like, cannot even believe this. Uh, Paxos has now burned $700 million of BUSD coin so far. And someone caught this by tracking um, all these different blockchains and finding out these are uh, accounts held by Paxos that hold the BUSD. My guess is what they're trying to do is to get back to parity where they have enough money to support the number of coins that still are in existence. So they just took a $700 million hit, a clear admission that at least 700 million of the coins out of 16 billion, they did not have the funds sufficient to cover those. If that's all that they do, that could mean that they're short five or 6%, 4%, of the money. I'm guessing that's not all that is about to happen. They're going to have to burn and just mark off more coins, hundreds of millions of dollars. And they're going to keep having to do that until the regulators are convinced that they're actually backed dollar for dollar with something else. And again, if it's backed by us dollars or us treasuries and you're into crypto because you hate all that shit, why the fuck are you buying this anyway? I, I just cannot wrap my head around 
the fantasy that crypto is somehow better than fiat currency. If you don't want to use fiat currency, don't. But this stuff is all a game. It's a multi-level Ponzi scheme of global proportions. And most of it has already collapsed. I mean, it went from $3 trillion in theoretical value to $1 trillion in theoretical value. And here is $700 million plus all the sales, another billion that just disappeared in a day or so. And there's a lot of coins out there that still have theoretical value, but they don't trade. And so if they don't trade, you can't get your money out. So they're listed on all these exchanges as being worth something, and they're not. Last I looked, three or four of the top six or seven coins on the planet are U.S. stable coins, which means they're U.S. dollars. And that could be almost half of the currency. And these markets have gotten a little bit better at tracking the coins that are lost and or have been burnt somewhere along the way. And as more and more of that becomes recognized and you take into account the ones that are stolen and you remove the ones that are stable coins backed by U.S. dollars, at least theoretically, um, I think we're down to under half a trillion is what's left. And the top four or five non-stable coins probably account for 80% of that market. And so thousands and thousands of coins have already been recognized as having gone to zero. The others will be recognized as having gone to zero. And we're going to hold out on a handful of the well-known funds, well-known cryptocurrencies, and they'll probably just slowly die dollar by dollar up and down over the next several years until everyone realizes that they would have been better off buying Beanie Babies. So that's your little update on the bullshittery, the fuckery that is crypto. Pace e lunga vita. Lunga vita e prosperità. You're listening to The Phil Ferguson Show. The Phil Ferguson Show is for educational and entertainment purposes only. Nothing said on the show should be interpreted as personalized investment advice. Investments should be based on your personal situation, and you, of course, should consult with your financial advisor or tax professional before taking any actions. A quick little segment on dividends, stock dividends, um, and uh, the idea of qualified dividends. One of my clients and listeners to the show, he asked me, he said, Phil, if I have a investment, a fund, like a value fund, we've been talking about uh, value versus growth a little bit lately, and he says, if I have this value fund that has high dividends, is that better off to be in an IRA and have the growth index fund that has very little dividends in the taxable account? And I said, eh, for the most part, it doesn't matter. It's, I mean, in some cases you could wiggle out a little difference, but it doesn't matter. And he said, well, but I thought that you have to pay a lot of taxes on dividends where you don't pay tax on growth or capital appreciation. And I said, oh, I know where you're coming from. Uh, That used to be the case years ago. And I don't know when this changed, but everyone still thinks it's the old fashioned way. Most stock dividends, dear listener, that you're ever going to get from any fund that I recommend or use, from almost any normal fund you're going to buy from the big mutual fund companies, the vast majority of the dividends that they're going to provide you into your account, whether it's an IRA or a taxable account or some other kind of account, but it really only applies and it really only matters in the taxable account, those dividends are going to be qualified dividends. Not all of them because of some timing issues and stuff like that, but the vast majority of dividends that you're going to receive in your taxable account are going to be qualified dividends. And you're like, what does that mean? Qualified Well, kind of like qualified and non-qualified accounts, regular unqualified dividends, you would pay your marginal tax rate on them 
uh, your income tax rate, which could be 25, 28, 30, 37 percent, maybe even state tax. But if they're qualified dividends, they're qualified for special tax treatment, which means you'll only pay your capital gains tax rate. So if your income or your combined income, if you're married, is low enough, the tax on those qualified dividends could be zero. Uh, I think that has to be something around under fifty, sixty thousand dollars of income. For most people, if you have a reasonably good wage or there's two of you earning money, you're probably going to pay 15%. And so you're essentially paying the capital gains, the long-term capital gains tax rates on dividends. And you're thinking to yourself, but if they're the long-term capital gains tax rates, shouldn't it be only applied to things that are long-term and capital gains? I know. So these things are neither necessarily long-term and they're definitely not capital gains. They're fucking dividends from stocks. But here you go. Uh, so the vast majority of U.S. companies, when they pay dividends, they'll be coded as qualified dividends, which means you might pay 0, 15, 23, or, or 20, or as high as 23.8, but you're not going to pay 18, 24, 28, 35, 37, 40% tax on that. And you might be like, whoa, when did this happen? I honestly don't know. And I didn't even bother to look it up because it doesn't really matter because this is how it works today. But this is one of those things that changed because wealthy people don't earn money, generally speaking. They get capital gains on their stock investments and they can sell those and pay the lower tax rates or they get dividends. And at some point they were getting dividends and paying the higher tax rates, even though they didn't have much earned income. And they thought to themselves, hey, we're rich. Why are we paying taxes? So at some point, the rules were changed a little bit. And if your dividends qualified, which, like I said, is the vast majority of all dividends, you're just going to pay the lower capital gains tax rates. Um, I was looking, I was reading up for this. And, and you, you look at your uh, 1099 DIV report that you're going to get from TD Ameritrade or wherever you have Schwab, wherever you have accounts at, and it'll break it down. I knew I looked at it, but there's bunches and bunches of lines and it'll have total dividends. And then at some point it'll have qualified or non-qualified dividends broken out. And you can look there, or of course you can run this by your actual tax professional. But I just thought I'd share this quick little memo with you that the vast majority of your dividends are going to be qualified dividends, which means you will pay tax rates that match long-term capital gains tax rates. And I thought you might find that interesting. Enjoy. The Pope discussing the existence of God with an out-and-out -out atheist starts off very correctly discussion and as the hours go by it gets more and more heated and eventually the pope turns to the man and he says the mom get the mom and you come here yeah. <laughs> you are like a man who is totally blindfolded in a dark room looking for a black cat that is not there Father, so we all respect your holiness. I think there's great similarity between us both. So why do you mean similarity? He said, well, as far as I'm concerned, you are like a man who is blindfolded in a totally dark room looking for a black cat that isn't there. The only difference is that you found it. This little segment is based on an email I received, and thank you for doing that. The, the sender is DT. They will know who they are, I'm sure, because I sent them a response, and my comments here are going to be pretty much the same as what I put in the email. Of course, if you have questions, you can send me an email, phil 
at polarisfinancialplanning.com. This one was about RMDs, RMD, Required Minimum Distribution, which used to be 70 and a half, and then they changed it to 72, and now it's going to 73, and in a decade it goes to 75. Uh, their question specifically is in reference to a comment that I've made multiple times in the past. I have said that you should take your RMDs pretty early in the year. And their question, of course, was basically, why? Why would you do that? Won't the money likely make more money? Aren't most years the market up in a calendar year? And, and that's an excellent point. I really do appreciate that you've put that much thought into it. So my response is a couple of things. One, I don't like to wait. So if there's something that needs to be done, my preference is to get it done relatively quickly. Some uh, custodians, qualified custodians like TD Ameritrade, Schwab, Vanguard, Fidelity, they might have a process where you can set up and automate the money coming out of your account. It'll be based on the value as of 1231, what your age is, perhaps what the beneficiary's age was, perhaps based on some other thing that you set. And it might be that with something like a beneficiary or inherited IRAs that they won't do it automatically because you have to figure that out or your tax professional has to figure that out. But for most people, it's pretty straightforward and easy calculation. The custodian could do it. You can double check online. You can double check with your tax professional. All great ideas. So number one, just, just get it done early because, because I don't like waiting. Uh, let's see. Number two I have here, um, you can take out the money and then invest it again. So if you're worried about losing the gains that you might have made during the year by leaving the money invested, if you don't need it now in January, February, or March, take it out so you've, you've met your obligation. You've taken the RMD. And then you turn around it and invest it in a taxable account. And if the market goes up 30% between the time you pulled it out and the end of the year, well, it's still invested money. You don't have to spend it. If you need it, you probably shouldn't wait to take it out because you need it. But uh, if you don't need it, take it out and just reinvest it. Now, one of the things that does worry me is what if the market goes down? So let's just say for conversation, you need to take out 7% of your IRA due to RMD rules, which would also mean that you're probably pushing 70. And you're thinking to yourself, well, I don't want to take that 7% out um, because it could go up. Like I said, you could take it out and then reinvest it. But one of the things that really truly does worry me and one of the driving factors for this, other than the two things that I just mentioned, what if the market goes down? What if the market goes down a lot? So if you have 100,000, and you have to take out 7% or 7,000, if your portfolio falls by half, well, and maybe you shouldn't be invested that aggressively, but I'm just theoretical. If it falls by half, you still have to take out 7% of the 100,000. If your portfolio is now 50,000, you're taking out 14% of the IRA money. So you're taking out essentially a percentage that's twice as big. Now, of course, you could invest it in a taxable account and if the market goes back up or when the market goes back up, you get all that money back. Again, you don't have to spend it if you don't need to, but why take out double or 20 or 30 or 50% more than you have to? So that's one of the reasons I like to take it early is because the amount you have to take out is based on the value of the account on 1231 of the previous year. So just get it done. Uh, and again, of course, the one of the questions is, well, you know, I'm delaying taxes and the emailer put something in there is uh, growing tax free as long as possible. Uh, I like to remind people and I did in the email that it's not growing tax free. It's growing tax deferred. So if we're talking about a, a regular 401k, a regular IRA, all of those accounts, you do have to pay tax on all of that money eventually unless you die. So you're going to have to pay tax on it. So you're not it's not growing tax-free, it's growing tax-deferred. Now, a really funny thing is that any money you take out of the IRA, 
let's say, let's go back to our, your portfolio is 100,000 or your IRA is 100,000, you have to take out 7%. That $7,000 counts as income in the year that you took it out. And you're going to pay whatever your income tax rate is, whatever your marginal tier is. And that could be 15%. It could be 25, 30, 35, close to 40. If you're doing really well and good for you, you've got money from other sources and the IRA is only a small part of it. If you keep that money invested, any amount that it grows, you're going to pay whatever your marginal tax rate is. If you take it out at the beginning of the year and invest it and it makes money, as long as you can avoid selling it for a year in a taxable account, any additional gains that you make would be taxed at a long-term capital gains tax rate. If your income is really low, that could be zero. If you're like most people, it's 15%. If you have really good income and or capital gains or you sell a lot of stuff, good things happen to you for a year or two or more, then you could be paying 20%, even 23.8%. But If you're paying 20 or 23.8% on your long-term capital gains, you're probably paying in the mid to upper 30s, pushing 40% in your your, uh, money you're taking out of the IRA. So if we're talking about a little bit over a year, for most people, you're going to go from around 30% tax to 15% tax on the gains. You're actually better off in a taxable account, which is kind of counterintuitive. The big perk for uh, IRAs and 401ks is that you get to delay the taxes for years and years and years and years and years. And when you have that advantage for 10, 20, 30 years, while you're deferring the taxes because it's tax tax later, it's not tax free, it's tax avoidance, tax putting offing, I don't know. You get to invest or you get to keep the, the money that you would pay on taxes and have that compound. And so the money you didn't pay on taxes earns money. The money that that didn't pay on taxes earns money. That is what makes an IRA and, and or a Roth IRA so magical. But when you get to retirement or close to retirement or whether you're going to take up money in this year or that year, the effect goes away. That compounding effect, at least for the part of money that you have to take out. So it can be argued, and I've done this in the past, I've done the segments about it, but if you're only a couple of years from retirement and the vast majority of all of your portfolio, your investments for retirement are in tax-privileged accounts where you're delaying the taxes or like a Roth, you already paid the taxes and under current legislation, you don't have to pay any taxes going forward, you might be better off for the last couple of years to stop adding to your IRA or 401k, put the money in a taxable account. And if that grows or when that grows or after that grows and you get to retirement, you can take out some of that money and only pay long-term capital gains tax rates on it, allowing you three, four, five, six more years of waiting to take the money out of the IRA because you now don't have to do that until you're 72 or 73. And of course, In a decade, it will be 75. So anyway, that's some of my logic for uh, taking RMDs pretty early in the year. And of course, if you do it and if you plan to do it in February and you forget, and then it comes around to May, well, you just do it in May if you don't have it set up automatically. But if you wait till the middle of December and then you get distracted and Christmas comes up and the holidays and you have family over and you forget, you can't fix it without a penalty in January or February of the following year. So Those are some of my thoughts on why you should probably try to, if possible, pull money out, the required minimum distributions, if you are in that situation, pull them out earlier in the year, it's going to be okay. And it'll be done. It'll be off your list. Enjoy. Thank you again for listening to the show. I greatly appreciate it. Hopefully you learned something about RMDs qualified dividends and the continuing crypto fuckery which will never go away and it's not going to get regulated and if it does get regulated then it's no longer really magic and special and outside the purview of the government which was one of the main features which it doesn't even really do now but 
Anyway, enough on that fun topic. I almost forgot, in addition to all of the other fun things we've had to do with the Florida House, which absolutely enjoying it, but um, there's many times where the builders cut corners and we're paying the consequences, maybe. I mean, I talked about earlier the oven. I don't know if they cut a corner there. It's just a fault with the oven, but you know, we, we had to do that. Um, the other thing that I'm considering, and this has nothing to do with the builder, is getting solar panels. I got solar panels in Illinois about two and a half years ago. And the gross price on those was 33 grand, but because of a federal credit and a state of Illinois credit and an additional credit from the utility company, ComEd, Commonwealth Edison company that I use still to this day in the Chicagoland area, the net cost to me was 13 grand out of pocket. So that's nice. So, you know, if I can save 1500 to $2,000 a year on electricity, the payback might be six years and hopefully they last 20, 25, 30 years until probably the roof needs to be replaced and you could take out the ones that aren't working or upgrade to new fancy schmancy, more high efficiency solar panels at some point in the future. So now in Florida, in the Orlando area, I'm doing the research and it suggests that because of the slightly uh, longer days in the summer when the sun is high and more sun exposure and being a further south latitude, I'm calculating anywhere to 15 to 20% more efficient the solar panels are. So that's kind of cool. I have one quote already and I have actually today, right after I get done making this recording, but probably before I mix the show and publish it, I have two more companies coming. Uh, the first one came in at $29,000 and they are also suggesting a system that would be 15 to 18% bigger than the one in Chicago. So if I get 25% more uh, just because of the change in latitude, the change in the environment, and then another 15%, you're talking 35, 38% more energy, which might actually be too much. I don't know. Uh, my current provider in Orlando is Duke Energy and Duke apparently with the assistance of Florida Power and Light, FPL, the other big electric company in Florida, convinced the Florida House, Senate, Congress, the Florida Congress, to pass a law to eliminate uh, the uh, pass-through or where, uh, oh my God, what do they call it? When you get credit for your electricity that you create from your solar panels when it's in excess to what you use. The governor who is a complete nutcase, and we'll talk about that more other times, actually vetoed it. Even though that was a totally Republican-passed law, he, the governor vetoed it, and we still have... Oh, net metering is what they call it. So if you use 10,000 uh, kilowatt hours of energy a year and your solar panels produce eight, well, then your bill eventually should only be on the $2,000 difference without regard to when you made it or if you made more than you used at any given moment in time. So with that being something that could possibly be resurrected, part of me is a little scared to get solar panels because I could spend quite a bit of money on them and lose 10, 20, 30%, 40% of the production would just be gifted to Duke Energy. That's not cool. That's really not cool. On the other front, Duke Energy is now waging the battle from a different direction where they are saying, they are claiming, and there's merit to this argument. I get it. That if everyone went solar, that's bad enough for them because they lose the revenue, but they still have to pay for the transmission lines and the metering equipment, and they have to be able to accept the electricity from you, and they have to be able to provide electricity from you, which is work for them and expenses for them, but yet they're not getting much money. And so what they have decided to do is pitch the argument that they should have a higher minimum fee for being connected to your house, which maybe was 10 or $15 and now it's $30 and maybe in the future it's going to go to 40 or $50. So the electric rate that I might pay or I might get if I produce extra electricity 
may actually go down, but the fixed portion might go up. And so that would undermine the theoretical value of what I'm producing because even if I produce more than the house needs, I'm still going to pay the minimum 50 bucks a month uh, for Duke uh, to provide the service of buying my electricity, providing the connection. And I don't know, what's, what's the right answer? It's, it's one of those things that these companies adapt over time to make money to changes in the marketplace. So that's something that, you know, maybe you'd have to be aware of. Uh, and also in Florida, I do get a 30% credit from federal taxes because everyone gets that anywhere in the United States, but there's no, there's no state, there's no state credit and there's no local utility credit. So if I paid 33,000, the uh, solar panels are not going to be netted down to 13. Uh, like I said, the first quote is 29 and it would be reduced by 30%, which I think is something like 24, which is quite a bit higher than the 13 I paid in Chicago, which is almost ironic. But like I said, it's a bigger system. So if I can choke down the system a little bit and maybe a little bit more because of the improved efficiency, maybe, maybe I can get something closer to 24,000 and 30% off of that is about eight. So maybe I could pay 16, maybe pushing 15. I don't know if this is possible. That's why I've got two more people coming from quotes. And of course, I can always go back to the first guy and say, hey, if you take 20% of the panels off of my system, would that lower the price by 20%? Because now you have certain things that are fixed, like hooking up to the electrical panel and, and having a sub panel and all the work and all the title work and compliance work that they have to do regardless of how many panels they they put on your house. So anyway, that adventure continues and I'll give you an update and whenever you're interested. And of course, if there's a topic or a question that you have that you think I should discuss on the show or at least answer for you via email, you can send me one of those emails, phil at polarisfinancialplanning.com. A uh, quick reminder, in just a couple of weeks, I will be at Free Flow, a Florida free thought convention right here in the Orlando area. Super easy for me to get to. And of course, I have already bought my tickets for the conference, the hotel, and the air flight, uh, airplane flight, airline tickets, boy, Englishing, to American atheists in Fahonix. I know it's Phoenix, Arizona around the Easter weekend. Um, that's April. Maybe I don't track Easter as well as I used to, but I'll check for the next episode of the show, but I will be at the American atheist. If you had not thought about it, you can go search for it. Now American atheists, uh, convention 2023. I'm sure to pull up all the details and you can go visit Phoenix in the spring. It'll be hot of course, but it won't be too bad because it won't be July or August. So hopefully I can see you in Phoenix. If not, hopefully I can see you in Orlando. And if we have other locations that come up, I'll let you know as soon as I can confirm that I'm going to be there. I do hope to see you at one of those locations or somewhere else. Until then, ciao.